Jeff Mitchell with Tight Lines Entertainment. I'm sitting here with Mike Schmidt, getting ready to tie up some flies. If you want to check out Mike, check out anglerschoiceflies.com. All right, so today we're going to go ahead and tie a version of BFH Double Deceiver. It's a weighted version of your standard Double Deceiver, uh, utilizing a fish skull from Flyman Fishing Company. Um, this pattern, normal size, is about five inches, so it's a little smaller than your normal Double Deceiver style fly. Um, gives you a bit of the same action, but the weighted head breaks the surface tension of the water so the fly gets down quickly. Um, so we're going to start off tying our thread mid-shank. Um, on the rear hook, it's not very important on an articulated streamer usually where you start your fly or the, your thread on the back of the fly uh, because you're going to cover it up with everything as you come forward. Uh, we're going to put a tail um, on this fly utilizing two feathers off the cape. We go ahead and pick them up, put them tip to tip, and tie it off the back of the hook shank about one and a half shank lengths. So I'll hold it in place and we're going to tie it side by side right down the top of the shank. So I'm going to trap those fibers with a couple of turns forward and back and then work my way back to about where the hook, the, head, the thread hangs down at the hook point. I'm going to bring that thread forward to the eye, about one thread wrap back of the eye. And we're going to tie in bucktail um, as the primary, the primary thing for this bug. So when we're playing with the bucktail, we're going to pull the fibers out so the hair tips are approximately equal. Then come in and pull out the longer fibers and the shorter fibers, leaving us with a group that's naturally tapered. We're going to take those and tie them in um, right at the eye of the hook, or just behind it. We're going to hold those out. We're going to follow the rule of halves. So when we hold this in to start building our taper, we want the hair to, to taper out halfway between the, the bend of the hook and the tip of the tail. So we're going to hold that hair in place. Two turns and tighten. Starts to flare that hair. Two turns and tighten. Two turns and tighten. And I'll come in, pull the butts up away from the eye, and carefully come in with the scissor points and clip those butt sections off. We're going to repeat that with our lighter belly color hair. So I'm going to come and again, I'm going to pull the hair up away from the center of the tail so it's approximately even. Come in and pull out any of the longer fibers, pull out any of the shorter fibers. Leaves you with the bundle that's usually around 70% or so what you, of what you cut off in the first place. We're going to measure out that hair so that it's just shorter and the chartreuse that we used on top. I'm butting my fingers right up against the eye of the hook as a measuring spot, so when I flip it over, tie it at the bottom, I can butt my fingers right up against it and I know I've got the right length. Again, one, two, tighten. One, two, tighten. One, two, tighten. And I'll go ahead and carefully trim those butt sections. Use your scissor points closed. You can use your scissors as a pick. Make sure that everything is where it's supposed to be on either side of the shank. We'll bring this back upright, and then we're going to use our ripple ice fiber. Now, ripple ice fiber can be a real pain to deal with. Uh, you want to always leave it in the package uh, to make it easier to handle. So what I'll do is I'll pinch with my left hand, come with the right, and lightly remove pressure on my left until I can start to pull those fibers out. We get a nice little bunch. I'm going to hold it in place just a little longer than the bucktail. Give myself a turn or two of thread, reverse it over itself and trap it down, and that'll give us a nice bit of sparkle right over the top of the bucktail. So I'll come in right up to the eye, whip finish, and that's the back half of the fly. Go ahead and put in uh, another Gami hook. It's a B10S, one size bigger, so in this case it's a size one in the front since we used a size two in the back. Where it doesn't matter where you start your thread on the back, on the front hook it does. We want to start right at the eye, and stripe back to the rear tying point, which again is when your thread hangs about to the hook point on this style of hook. What we've done there is lay down essentially a ribbing that's going to allow friction between the wire that's metal and the shank that's metal. So that that ribbing allows us to have something to grip these two together so they don't pull apart as easily. Uh, I pre-cut the wire in this case, so I've got four inch, uh, four inch wire. And I, to make this connection, what we're going to do is I bend the wire tip to tip and then come in and give it just a little bit of a pinch. All we're really doing is measuring out on the wire where the center point is. So when I slide the fly into place, the back of the fly falls right to that center point. I can put on two beads 
to help keep material from fouling in that wire loop. And then we'll tie this on, now knowing it's wires in half, so when I go ahead and wrap this forward, I want the tips of that wire to be right behind the eye of the hook. And now I know I'll have a consistent length every time I tie that fly. The way we're gonna do this connection, um, with any braided wire, anytime you bend it, you get a 90 degree twist. So to keep the loop vertical in the back, you need to tie the wire in side by side on top of the hook shank. So I place it on top of the hook shank, very carefully cover those cut sections. And then to do this connection, under tight thread pressure, we're gonna go back and forth twice over the front half, wrap to the rear, a couple of nice tight turns at the rear, and go back and forth twice over the back half. And then we're gonna go from the back all the way to the front, twice. Tied under pressure, you do not have to worry about using any sort of glue at this point. You're doing crossing wraps, you're coming forward on exaggerated forward, back on an exaggerated back. As you look down the side, you can literally see the X's of the thread wrap. Um, at this point now, just like finger cuffs, the harder you pull, the tighter that connection is gonna get. So we're gonna come kind of to the midway of the front shank, and we're gonna tie in what's basically just gonna help to veil the center of the fly. Uh, what I never like to see in an articulated fly is one fly in the back and one fly in the front separated by some wire in the middle. You wanna see one continuous profile. So one way to ensure that is to make sure that there's something filling that gap. So we're gonna go ahead and use a couple of schlappen feathers here, one on each side. Again, to just kinda of help fill that gap in the center of the fly. So we'll hold them up, measure them out, clip the butts, and then wrap them over to tie them into place. Um, we're gonna finish this fly off with the fish skull up front. So we don't wanna go all the way to the eye, we need to leave enough space um, that we can slide that skull on and compress it in. So with the size medium small that we're doing on the skulls, uh, we need to leave ourselves approximately one full eye width of space. So I've got my thread sitting there marking that spot. I'm gonna come in on the tail and again cut my chartreuse hair for the top. And we're essentially gonna repeat the steps from the back. So I pull out the longer hairs, I pull out the shorter hairs, and I hold it in place. At this point I want the tips to go halfway from the eye of the rear hook to the hair on the rear hook. And that, again, is giving you that built-in taper as you come forward. I'm gonna hold up that hair, and when I switch my hands, I'm gonna go two wraps and tighten, two wraps and tighten, two wraps and tighten. I'll get one more wrap for security, and then pull those butts carefully up away from the eye, work my scissor points in, and cut all that hair on a bit of a wedge. What we've got here now as you look at the eye from the bottom or from the top, you've got a little bit of hair sticking out on either side, and that hair is going to be used as a compression fitting for the skull when we move to, to push the skull on at the end of the fly. Um, before we get to that point, though, we've got to add the bottom color, so we're going to go ahead and get our lighter base color. Again, prep it by pulling out the longer hairs, pulling out the shorter hairs, and we're going to measure it up. Again, using my fingers against the eye of the hook to make sure I've got it set. You have the hair be slightly shorter than the hair on top, which ensures you have a little less material on the bottom. It's important both visually and for the action of the fly. Uh, when you're using natural materials like this, they've got natural buoyancy to them. If you've got more material on the bottom of the hook shank, it's gonna have a tendency to try and right itself, and that's the most common thing that will cause a fly to come in on its side or even upside down. So we're gonna go ahead and add a little bit of sparkle to this. Again, pulling out the ripple ice fiber the same way we did in the back. I'm gonna hold it in place on top of the shank. A couple turns of thread and reverse it over itself. Come to the bottom, do the same with our lighter color of ripple ice fiber. Again, we're measuring it out so it's about the same length as the bucktail that we're tying it over. So we'll turn and reverse it. And if we want to add a pink throat, I'll go ahead and pull out a pink, pink throat here. So pull out that material. This is one case where I will actually take the material and kind of rip and stack it a little bit just to get a smaller stack. I want it to be relatively even, so I'll pick out the longer fibers again, rip them off, and then come in and tie this in. It's going to be two turns, reverse it over itself, another couple of turns to hold it in place. Use your scissors with the points all the way closed as a pick and make sure that there's nothing that's being trapped down to the shank. The last step here before the head is gonna be come right up to the eye of the hook, so we advance in front of 
where we just tied everything in and pull out four to six pieces of peacock curl. We'll lay that peacock curl right over the top, slightly longer than the bucktail, and tie it in with a couple nice tight wraps right at the eye. You know, you can see here how that peacock curl is in front of everything that we just tied in. The reason we're doing this peacock curl is twofold. One, it's gonna ensure that the fly's got a dark back. And two, is when we tie on utilizing these fish skulls, there's a gutter on the top of the skull. And you need something that's gonna come up and fill that space, otherwise you got an open blank area. So I'm gonna to start to slide that head on, pull all the materials back out of the way, and you get to the point where the eye starts to be exposed. As long as you can get the eye partially exposed, at this point you can use your whip finisher, slide it up through the eye of the hook, lever that head back to give yourself the space you need. To finish this off, we're gonna go ahead and glue the head on. So what we're gonna do here is I'm gonna pull all the materials back out of the way with my finger and my thumb right at the back edge of the skull, gripping all the material and the shank of the hook. I can slide the head off without moving my fingers. I can go ahead and put a bit of glue around the side and top of the eye of the hook, right behind the eye of the hook. Then I can take that head and in one motion without stopping, push it back until the back of the skull touches my fingers. That way I know the eye is exposed. Hold it there for a couple of seconds to let that glue fuse. And then when you remove it, now you can see you've got a nice open eye on your fly. So the last step is to go ahead and glue the eyes into the recesses here. So we're gonna put just a small dot of glue in the recess on each side. And then we're gonna use the eyes that come with the heads. Take one eye and put it on one side. And when I lay it down, I'll lay it one edge and roll it back. Again, that's ideally rolling the glue away from your fingers. Place the eye on the second side, again, edge, and then rolling it back. And I'll grab those and hold it together. So then the last thing you need to do on these is now remove your fingers from the head without weakening the bond of the glue to the eyes. So the worst thing you can ever do when you glue eyes on, you're holding them and then just set it down and let go. What you want to do every time you utilize Loctite gel or any other adhesive to glue these eyes on, you want to take your fingers, rotate 90 degrees in your hand, and then you can go ahead and let go. What you're doing when you do that is it shears any glue that came out and st stuck to your fingers. You're shearing that bond as opposed to pulling straight apart and potentially weakening that bond. So in the long run, by turning it 90 degrees, you're shearing all that glue, then you can let go and you know you've got the strongest bond possible. And that is your BFH double the